episode 9 of the X Umbers podcast. Scholar McClarney speaking here, and with me is none other than Schoolman Fawcett, his lowly underling at the Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore Learning Center, which is the first online Chesterton Academy in the world. Uh, and happy feast of St. Isidore of Seville, except it's not actually because Holy Week overrules it. I'm refusing, it. I'm refusing to feast today. No, we are not. Uh, yes, that's true. It's Saint Isidore is not important enough. Well, he would he'd be glad, I think, to that's defer right. right attention if, onto Jesus Christ. If Saint Christ. Patrick has to like be bumped out when March seventeenth is in Holy Week, uh, I don't see even the feast of the Annunciation. The Annunciation, so right? That gets trumped. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, but we'll acknowledge him all the same. Okay. Uh, in the spirit, you know, of it. So uh, before we start today's episode, I wanted to read a quote yep. from a commentary on the Gospel of John. Okay. I want to see if you can guess who wrote this, Dr. Okay. McClarney. Well, 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 should we tell him what the topic of the No, podcast? we should not, no, because, we should that'll, not. because that will right. def- that will ruin my oh, carefully constructed all gag. Right. So, all right, so, so. And then you can notice, too, we're, we're experimenting as well with our, our cameras. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this, this could be complete uh, garbage, um, yeah. not in terms of the content and quality, but of, of what the we're visual, saying. Yeah. yeah, visually it might be. We'll right. see. So, um, I, I don't know. Okay, let's hear throw. I'm going to throw this quote at you, see if you can guess who wrote this. All right. The ancient peoples, the savages who have not yet heard the teaching of Christ, betray an inner unrest, a fear of the anger of the gods, an inner conviction of their own iniquity, by making sacrifices to their gods, imagining they can atone for their sins by sacrifices. Indeed, the greatest sage of antiquity, the divine Plato, expresses in more than one passage a profound longing for a higher being, whose appearance would fulfill the unsatisfied striving for truth and light. Thus, the history of pe- uh, the history of peoples teaches us the necessity of union with Christ. Who do you think said that? Oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I, I I have no idea. I mean, I'm in, I was going to guess you're going to say Saint Augustine because he wrote a lot of John's Gospel, but he he wouldn't say that. So um, you just know he wouldn't say that. He would not say that. Uh, so uh, interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things you want to say there, but okay. Uh, right. okay so, so um, is this someone from the Enlightenment era? This is someone. This is in 1835. Okay, so I'm again the right ballpark. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna say Rousseau, maybe. Uh, try stranger. Try more surprising. More than stranger that. than Rousseau. Yes, more even more stranger than that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know who can tell me. Yeah. This was a uh, young student in the German gymnasium named oh, Karl oh, Marx. I should have known this. Yes, that oh, hence me not okay. wanting to give away our subject, our subject, our topic today. Sorry, I amalgamated those words, uh, okay. which is we are comparing Plato and yes. his ideal republic to the ideal of uh, Karl Marx, the ideal society of Karl Marx. This was suggested by a student uh, who I won't name out of respect for their, uh, I guess, anonymity. But I thought it was an excellent suggestion, comparing the ideal societies of Plato and Karl Marx. And I thought we would kick it off, because I cannot find... Marx does not talk much about philosophers. Of course, right. he thinks that uh, philosophers have tried to understand the world, but the job is really to change it. So he has a lot of disdain oh, for yeah. philosophy. Right, right. One of his books is titled The Poverty of Philosophy, yes, which is a yeah. response to a book called The Philosophy of Poverty. Uh, but he it. mentions Plato here. He mentions Plato in this... Um, yeah. He wrote this because he, you know, he was going to a, a school in Germany, and yes. you know there was an expect, you know, he had to take theology, I suppose, and had okay. to write a paper for oh, the class. So this is like one of his grad papers. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think how old he would have even been. Yeah, basically, yeah. like it's, okay. he wrote it. I think even in like high school, you know, or whatever the equivalent okay. would have been. Okay. Uh, so now his his ethnic background was Jewish, right? He was descended from rabbis, but his father had converted to Protestantism so that he could work in the Prussian <laughs> government, I want to say. He was kind of civil servant or something. Yep, right. So, um, so he was sort of nominally, I think, you know, from a Christian Lutheran, background. Yeah. But yeah, basically. But uh, so he, you know, he wrote, perhaps there are students in Catholic schools today who do this, uh, yeah. <laughs> who write theology papers that they don't fully subscribe to. Right, uh, right. Or, who, or who knows, maybe he had a conversion experience. But it's a, yes. a, a fascinating little, I mean, maybe we'll come back to it, but very interesting how it views Christ as a fulfillment of history. Yes. I think, right, history, you know, Plato and the ancients are longing for this divine union that it comes in Christ. Right, yeah, uh, which is like God in Spes, uh, number 10. Sure. Is like Christ is the, the pinnacle of history, right? And, and, and so, okay. So sure, Mark's the theologian. Yes. Um, and then as he, as he goes on, he replaces Christ with something else. And I'd argue that's what he does. 
Oh, wow. um, but okay. we can talk about that when we come to his historical materialism. So, yep. uh, Dr. McClarney is a is a scholar in addition to being a scholar okay. of Saint Augustine. Okay. That's how he was able to recognize that there are certain uh, I don't know what's the opposite of a dog whistle. What's a what's a phrase that shows that it's not somebody? There are certain <laughs> key phrases or something that Augustine Incron wouldn't have said. Maybe? I guess so. Like, yeah. yeah. Right. Some red flags, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, no, no communist pun intended there. Yeah. That it, this was <laughs> that this couldn't have been Saint Augustine. Yes. Uh, August, Augustine is a Platonist, so yeah. uh, we both happen to have our copies for those of you who are watching this of the complete uh, works of Plato. So I assume we're going to talk about Book Five of the Republic, or where would you like to go with this? I, I, well, I was going to start globally, just saying what are some similarities, differences between Plato and, um, and Marx, Marx and, then, okay. and then go from there. I, I want to speak about mythology in particular, but but in any case... Sure, that's we can kick if, right off with that if you think that that's a good entry point into this. Well, uh, okay. I mean, certainly Marx is already talking about the ancients and their longing for divine union and their sacrifices to their gods, so yep. maybe that's a good yep. segue into uh, mythology. I, I suppose it doesn't hurt to give a, a, bit, a bit of... Maybe we'll get into a bit of overview, but generally, this is what I would say. And perhaps people don't think this way necessarily all the time on top of their heads, but I would argue one of the major similarities between Plato and Marx is they're both profoundly religious figures. Mm. Right. So, yes. uh, and uh, yes. another one is they're teleological. So they have a. Are we just going to let that religious figures reference uh, stand? We, or do, do we, we want to do, do we, do we have to get into A that? few people okay. are fuming at us right now. Do we want to <laughs> throw them a bone or do we just want to proceed? Okay. Well, I think when we explain his mythology, his religious element comes. But we'll get into it. Let's get All right, into sure. it. We'll get sure. into it. Okay. They're teleological. So mm -hmm. they both have a, a vision of, of design purpose mm -hmm. for the individual and for the society. You could go a little further, certainly with Plato, for the cosmos and, and reality as a whole. Uh, Marx is going to be a little bit more limited to the individual and society. His version of the cosmos mm -hmm. and reality as a whole as well, I suppose, is, mm -hmm. is, is, is a redu reduced vision of reality. But it, yes. his, his mm -hmm. framework is teleological in that uh, element as well. Uh, another one uh, I thought of is they're both idealists. And should we, should, I, I suppose we should quickly say, what does oh, teleological mean? Tele what is teleological? Uh, well, it comes from the Greek word telos, which has to do with mm -hmm. completion, perfection, mm -hmm. fulfillment. Uh, and so, thinking in Aristotelian terms, what is the purpose of an acorn? It's to become an oak tree, if it's an oak, and so mm -hmm. on. What's the purpose of a human? It's to experience eudaimonia. It's the mm -hmm. full flourishing of, of who we are. Uh, Jesus tells us to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's using the word mm -hmm. telos mm -hmm. there. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's what it means. So to, to reach this, what you're designed to do. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So they both have this vision of what hu human society is designed to do or where it's going. It's purpose, an overarching end. Terminus in Latin would be terminal, right, for, for telos. Mm -hmm. um, then also idealists so they have this mm. idealism of what now again marx might not agree with this mm -hmm. but I, I think this is what he is uh, uh and for him it's justice what justice is um and okay so those those are some and you don't mean idealist in like a Kantian sense or that kind of not not in an epistemological oh. sense but do you mean like or do you mean that or do you just mean idealist in that they have ideals that they are aspiring towards Ideals that they're aspiring towards, I like certainly it, it takes an epistemological sense as well mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they look at reality and what you're ultimately striving for. So for um, Plato, for example, what we're doing right now is dialectic. Yeah. We're, we're exchanging ideas and logos and that's going to lead us towards the idea, the ideos, the realms, the, the forms, right? Mm -hmm. right? And so for Marx, he has a more post-Baconian uh, yep. approach to how you're going to achieve insight knowledge it's not through mm -hmm. this exchange of dialogos <clears throat> where we can uh, apprehend the universal forms or eternal immutable realm uh, rather it's the inverse mm -hmm. it's going to be through a well he would call it scientific we would call it quasi scientific mm -hmm. method of not striving for the heavenly realm but for the earth below or really human history uh, and using the, the quasi-scientific approach proposed science to look at uh, history and unfurl its mysteries mm -hmm. uh, now there's a profound contradiction in in marx's atheism maintaining an atheism and a teleological vision of humanity but uh, I don't know, we can maybe leave that drop for now. But um, th that's a difference with Plato, certainly, is Plato's not going to be. Um, he has, a, I think, he has a 
better ground in which he's standing to achieve his um, his uh, vision of what we're heading for and what justice is, as opposed to Marx, who's going to use different means of trying to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and, and oh, another one is they're both iconoclasts of sorts. Yeah, yeah that's so, true. So mm-hmm. they um, they are both dismantling. Uh, or at least attempting to, mm-hmm. what's come before them and replace it with with what they're offering. Um, and um, here, here's another one to that end. They both disdain myth, but write their own mythology. So so they disdain myth, but they are thoroughgoing mythologists. So um, then that's a, that's another commonality. Um, so I don't know where, where you, if you feel free to jump in sure, there. You probably well, no, no, that's, I, 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 actually, that makes me wonder, do, do you want to then explain mythology? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh, that, sure. All right. What do we mean by this? So it's probably confusing again for some people to consider Marx a mythologist. I mean, he's an avowed atheist and materialist, uh, materialist who just believes in, um, concrete matter, right? Uh, physical realm. What does it do with mythology? Well, by mythology, we don't mean orcs, dragons, and uh, and so on. Although, a reading, and you read this uh, Communist Manifesto, uh, and r- if you read through there, it makes it interesting, uh, Marx and Engels uh, liken the bourgeoisie to sorcerers. Yes, <laughs> yeah. and, in, and in Das Kapital, he compares capitalism to a vampire. Oh, okay. So right. there, he's prone to use that kind of language, yes. mythological imagery. Yeah. And as sorcerers, the bourgeoisie have conjured up uh, from the underworld yes. uh, these forces that now, now spin beyond their control, and yes. they're, they're spiraling out. So now, like the brooms in Mickey Mouse's uh, something like this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. As a sorcerer's apprentice, yes, yes, he makes all the brooms stomp right. around, and then they but that's get not, out of his control. That's not what I mean by myth or mm-hmm. mythology. Uh, I mean, what I what what do I mean then? A creation of a narrative that gives meaning in order to life. So by myth, what I mean is a creation of a narrative that gives order and meaning to life. Now, it's a very similar definition to a functionalist understanding of religion. A functionalist understanding of religion is basically religion is whatever gives order and meaning to your life. It's a similar definition we see in the Bible when it comes to both the true God and idols, all right? So, so uh, Psalm 135 talks about uh, these idols made of gold, right? And they, they don't speak, they can't hear and don't talk, but people bow down to them. So functionally, these golden idols, these golden calves, if you like, serve the role of um, a, a deity. Okay, um, so uh, mythology or, or mammon, right? That would be another one that, that Jesus uses, uh, lust and so on. These can be gods that we worship. Now. What does that do with mythology and how is Marx writing mythology? Well, again, but what I mean by mythology is a narrative that gives meaning to one's life. Now, let me give you three reasons why uh, he's doing this. So in the opening line of the Communist Manifesto, we have this history, all of history, hitherto, uh, of, of existing societies is a history of class struggles. struggles. There we got it, mm-hmm. yes. And so... What does that line do? That opening line, what does that do? It sets a framework by which all of history can be interpreted. Now, just because you do history, I mean, you teach history, right? Uh, or you come up with an interpretation of history, does that make you a mythologist, uh, Schoolman Fawcett? Ooh, I almost want to say yes, a oh, little bit. If, 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 if it's a theory that's supposed to encompass all of history yeah. and explain every me- mechanic of history. Okay. Um, like international realism, maybe that's kind of oh, a myth. Okay, okay, there we maybe, go. Maybe, arguably. Right, right. I'm, okay. I need to chew on that a bit, but what do you think? Okay, well, I would say uh, certainly the vast majority of e- economists would venture, and no pun intended, uh, mm-hmm. that they aren't de facto mythologists, mm-hmm. right? So, so they're just interpreting past historical e- economic events and so on. But what's different with what Marx is doing is he's giving this existential and quasi-cosmic framework to his economic history all right so he's not just making claims on past human history but also the future as well and what our telos is our destiny uh, all right so you want to think of it as as a mythologist then he's giving what he's both descriptive and prescriptive so his mythology encompasses both those in the sense of trying to describe what we are in the past where we've come from that's mythological as well as his prescription for the future. Now look at the, how the next lines of the uh, opening page of the 
Manifesto Go. He says this, quote, Free men and slave, patrician and uh, pleban, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on in an under, uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in common ruin of the contending classes. End quote. Now, put it another way, his description of, of the human past is this existential struggle between who? The oppressed mm -hmm. and the oppressor. It's a struggle, put in different words, between good and evil, right? Yes, is it yeah. not? Mm -hmm. Right? It's the forces of light yes, and darkness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't get more mythological than that, do if, you? If you assume that the oppressed are necessarily the ones you're supposed to have moral sympathy for. <laughs> okay, right, right. Which, right. Is, which is a very religious impulse. It's not obvious. Yes. Um, Perhaps, yes. Yeah, I, I suppose for us it might seem obvious. And for Marx, he makes that assumption as well. Mm -hmm. Does he not? So, again, looking back to his description of humanity, and this ties in with his prescription of what we should do about this. So now, remember earlier we said about the bourgeoisie sorcerers, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, they cast this uncontrollable spell, and they, they, they've summed up this gigantic means of uh, production and exchange that they can't control now. Now, again, that does not make Marx mythologist by saying that. I mean, that's just a metaphor. But look at how his analysis unfolds. The result of this spell will be the overproduction that will result in the uh, collapse of the capitalist order. Now, I'm quoting Marx again here. The weapons with which the bourgeoisie felled feudalism to the ground are now turned against the bourgeoisie itself. And quote. So in fact, capitalism then is this necessary stage in human history. And he says uh, again, the more modern bourgeoisie is the necessary offspring of feudalism. So feudalism comes before uh, the bourgeoisie. Uh, prior to that, what do we have? Well, it's the master-slave state. And um, prior to that, what's the most primitive stage? Primitive communism. Uh, so this is our opening stage. So people are in, in primitive communism. This is kind of like the uh, like the fall or yeah. before the fall, right? Yeah. This yeah. is where people uh, gather goods and exchange them, but it's prior to the uh, division of labor and surplus value. So so there's there's no uh, hoarding and, and, and things like this, and everything's kind of this, this pristine state. All right. Mm -hmm. So that that that's again. How does Marx know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. How does he know about this lost? primitive age, uh, this ideal age. This ideal, well, uh, one reason uh, Marx and Engels would, would say is that they've, uh, as they would have it at least, they've peered into human history, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So Plato, we mentioned earlier, will ascend the heights through dialectic to the realm mm -hmm. of forms. Well, they peer through this purportedly scientific method of looking at history and so on. Um, and it turns out history is did you know this? It's deterministic. Mm. <laughs> Did you know mm. that? So, so it's this, and it unfolds with predictability as well. You might expect in a materialistic world, would you not? Uh, now, second of all, uh, this method is what they're looking at. It's not nihilistic. So that's important to note. They're not waiting for a Godot who uh, <laughs> never appears, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. So, so they're not like the French as existentialists. No, they're like Moses. Right, mm -hmm. who's who sees the promised land uh, in the not so distant future, just around the corner, and that's in the fifth, in the really the sixth stage of of, of history. So the, you have the uh, primitive communism, that's the first stage, which leads then to this master slave state, which then leads to feudalism, uh, and then that leads to the bourgeoisie capitalism. For Marx, this is all determined. This is how things had to unfold, but capitalism is going to then lead to the sixth, the fifth stage socialism and then finally the sixth stage which is communism pure communism uh, all right so the death throes of capitalism that's the the going to lead to the fifth stage which is socialism where uh, governments will be forced to nationalize uh, the means of production and so on this they will finally be in the hands of the proletariat humanity is now ready for this final stage and guess what in that final stage we will no longer exploit each other did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, government structures will be, um, and, and states will be superfluous. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the family. It can be shed as well, the family structure. Uh, and so, which is not unlike Plato's Republic, mm -hmm. when it comes to people sharing things in common, including family, mm -hmm. uh, um, right, the breakdown there. And uh, so, this is a prophetic vision 
of the a future based on uh, uh, their mythological understanding as well of, of the past. So again, we're not saying just because you're an economist uh, predicting the future. I mean, financial advisors do that all the time. It doesn't make you a myth maker. What is mythological, though, is this offering of this existential narrative by which not just people, but societies can organize and give meaning to their lives. And it's a story which you too, Comrade Fawcett, can organize your life as we take up arms and overthrow uh, the bourgeoisie and usher in socialism as this penultimate stage mm -hmm. before pure communism. Mm -hmm. Will we? Will you join me? Uh, well, let, <laughs> let me let me read Plato first. Okay. Let me see what Plato has to All say right. about this. Okay. I mean, do you, so do you think that the Republic is supposed to be something similar to this? Mm. Is it also well, meant to be a myth for us to organize ourselves around? Or uh... absolutely, uh, the the Republic. Well, I'm. Okay, there's, there's a few things uh, to say there. So, Plato is also a thoroughgoing mythologist. He dis purportedly disdains myth. It's like on the lowest end of, of like poetry and literature are, are part of the realms of change uh, and shadow. So, so they're, they're a little... Bit... But for someone who has a low view of, of myth, uh -huh. he sure uses a lot of myth. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh -huh. and, and in fact... Um, from the opening line of the Republic to Book Ten, it, it, it book ended with with mythology. Just one example. I gave you two. I'll say the book ends. So the opening line is, "I went down." Mm -hmm. Catabasis. I don't know if we talked about this before. Yeah, not not on, not on camera. Not on camera. Okay, okay. we did. Okay, so uh, catabasis is a profoundly mythological word. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of anabasis, which is going up like a stairs or ascending, like the Psalms of Ascent. Anabasis is the is the word in the Septuagint there. Uh, so to go down is this, it's, it's tapping into the hero's journey, right? So, so this, this leaving of the, the world of Athens mm -hmm. to, to the Prius, uh, where, where he's going down on this journey, which um, like going into the underworld, right before a return transformed and the entire republic takes place it, you can you can read it in ten and a half hours mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want like, it's like the course of a day right mm -hmm. uh and, and so this this journey which um and it, and so you come back transformed right so mm -hmm. this is the the whole point in, in, in the heart well part of the heart of it is like the allegory of the cave uh right which is a profoundly mythological analogy and then um the myth of uh Ur at the end so that that too is like a um it, it's the cap on the end of the the story, uh, some some scholars liken it to a uh, a child lock on on Plato's Republic. Like, what is the end with a myth at the end? Um, but um, a different way of looking at that is the same thing with the Gorgias. It ends with the the myth of the Blessed Isle. It has to because there it's explaining how justice works because it's giving an afterlife uh, and, and, and a rationale for for the afterlife, which. Plato says, well, you probably think this is, and the Gorgias says, this is wives' tales, right? Mm -hmm. You probably don't take any stock in this, but I say it's true. Uh, um, and so he gives you this explanation. So um, myth then is, is uh, essential. It's essential to Plato explaining justice and what it means to live in a society and, and people and meaning and so on. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's profound. Yeah, it's, it's profoundly intertwined in, in all that he's doing. Even though he goes and edits the, the quote-unquote Bible of his day, right? Yes. So, so Homer, yeah. he can like, let's take this out, that out, and others. So in that sense, he's profoundly iconoclastic, but replacing it with his own myth. Now, mm -hmm. before going too far in explaining the similarities between Marx and Plato, I do want to um, just make a little caveat or asterisk footnote for some other discussion. Um, I don't think... Plato necessarily goes entirely off the rails. Uh, in, in some some 20th century interpreters, like say Karl Popper, uh, Popper who, who talks about uh, the open society and his enemies, says yes. Plato has cast this spell yes. on on us. Uh, and, yes. um, and and so uh, even these like uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, who's drank his own poison, and and now he too is captivated by his own spell, like is out of control, kind of like what Marx is saying about the bourgeoisie, like they mm -hmm. cast a spell and it's beyond their control. All right, I right. don't take that uh, interpretation. I don't. I don't quite agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. That look at Plato, but um, anyhow, um, yeah, that, that that's. I think that mythos. Is, okay, you want to jump in though? Sure. Well, yeah. I suppose. Well, I just want to. Well, add. I mean, sure. Popper is 
I don't know if this is what the student who requested this episode was thinking of. Oh, I don't know okay. if they were aware of Karl Popper, but the Open Society and its enemies, which sort of advocates right. for an open liberal society, which is totally tolerant of everything other than intolerance. Uh, the two volumes and the two great villains that Popper identifies in history are Plato and Marx. He says they are the enemies of the yep. open society right. because they both are, I guess, implicitly totalitarian. Uh, yes. They both say that society has to be organized around a certain ideal of good, whereas Popper's liberalism says, you know, you can't say what's good. You know, you let everyone choose for themselves what's good. Yes. That's what an open society means. It's open as yeah. opposed to Plato. You know, yeah. Plato wants society to be very rigidly controlled, supposedly. And Marx also has this very rigid idea of what a good society is. And both of those have yielded, you know, terror in, right. you know, the, especially, you know, throughout history, uh, particularly in the 20th century when Popper's writing. Uh, and his... Uh, how he characterizes both Plato and Marx has been uh, subject to criticism, let's say. Yes, uh, but yeah. I think ever since then, you can see um, why maybe Plato and Marx are have this association in people's minds. Yeah, would you? I'd like to disassociate, but uh... well, yeah. And well, let's maybe let's let's do that then. So, okay, let's let's start with communism itself. All right, sure. The, the, the communal ownership of uh, well, calling it property is already redundant of goods and yes. of. Uh, sexual partners, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Plato has this. So Marx wants to universalize this. Everyone should live in communism, yeah, ideally. Yeah. Right? We should transcend beyond capitalism and private yeah. ownership of the means of production. And there should be, as he says in uh, the Communist Manifesto, a community of goods and a community of you know, women, basically. <laughs> it's what yes. they're accused of, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas Plato, uh, Plato has something similar, but it's yeah. stratified. Right? There's the three levels of society, mm -hmm. and the communism is, is reserved. Most people would not live in communism. Right. Uh, let's, uh, you want to delve into that, those three layers of society that Plato identifies. And... Well, you have your auxiliaries, right? Uh, then you have your warrior class, and then you have the guardians. Uh, and, and so this is an isomorphic society. That it's isomorphic with your soul. All right. So, okay. so you have the um, the appetites, the thumos, and then the nous. So those would be your desires of uh, uh, appetites. Also, then the thumos would be like your will to dominate desire, in that sense. Um, and then finally, your mind, uh, faculty of reason. Mm -hmm. And crowning this, of course, is the philosopher king. So until kings become philosophers and philosophers will become kings, they'll, the city will have no rest from evils. Uh, yes. And so this is what Plato's vision is. And Yes, there are certain absolutely dystopian <laughs> streaks in Plato. We can't, sure, we sure. can't, we can't sugarcoat that. Uh, but so, why does he? Why does he confine communism? Why? Why do the majority of people, the auxiliaries, who correspond to our, you know, we have desires and appetites, and corresponding to that, we have most people. They they would still have property. They would still get married and have children, right? Why does? Why is this um, liberation from? Like, so, whereas the guardians. The people who yes. are making the decisions for society, yeah. right at the top, they would be have a kind of enforced poverty. Is that a fair way of putting it? An enforced poverty, and they wouldn't be able to have families, and there'd be a communism among them, right? Is that a yeah, fair yeah, act? Yeah, that, yeah, and why yeah. does and why does he restrict it? Why doesn't he say everyone should get to live this lifestyle? Well, I suppose the the I mean, there's the drones beneath them, right? Who 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 uh, have their function in in the hive, but um, I. I I would venture that uh, this is a, the uh, it may be anachronistic to use this term, but a vocation, right? This is the call uh, of which these noetic uh, guardians must must adhere to. So they're not uh, acting out of interest of their own f family or property or, or inheritance or whatever it is, vying in that sense. But they have the good of the whole in mind, uh -huh. uh, right? So that that's. Mm, a purify a purification, I suppose, of their desires and actions, and, and, and mm. so on. I don't know, is, is that what, uh, well, I, don't, I mean, that's what I'm wondering. It seems yeah. to me like Plato sees communism as a form of asceticism, right? Right, yeah. uh, because there are certain people who should who aren't concerned for themselves. They're concerned for yeah. the common good, yes. the good of the whole city, the whole Calipolis. Yeah. They therefore have to renounce property and renounce family. Uh, so that they can devote themselves totally to the service of others. And most people are not going to be like that. They're not going to have the intelligence or right. the selflessness to do that. So, uh, and, and, and Marx seems yeah. to think, I'm not Marx, Plato seems to think that's maybe a good thing in the long run that they don't, because we need people who engage in commerce, 
because that yes. will kind of generate the goods and the prosperity that a city needs. Right. Um, and you have some people who are more noble than them, but aren't yeah. philosophers, and so they yeah. get to be soldiers and kind of run. yeah, defend defend the people. Yeah, right. Uh, whereas Marx seems to think it would be great if everybody was communist. Nobody that there wasn't um, a family right. unit in that sense. Yes. Um, and everyone works. Right. He almost wants. It's almost as if he wants to merge the guardians and the auxiliaries into one and and, it, and that it would be and that the proletariat the worker is going to rebel and take over the means of production out of a kind of selfishness out of self-interest that's sort of the opposite of plato right their, their right. communism that's is some kind of yeah. reward yeah. right um of an aspirational desirable thing and he, and and marx you know he's nebulous too about what it would look like his ideal society he intentionally says we you know we wouldn't know Right. right yeah. um, we'd be free then. So who knows what people do with their freedom? Like right now, most people are wage slaves, and even the, the, the capitalist is locked into the system and doesn't really have much freedom to maneuver with what he can do. And if we had a, a truly free society, well, who knows? There could be a lot of leisure. Uh, Terry Eagleton, the uh, Catholic literary critic who's kind of a Marxist, says it would be sort of like a, we'd all live like Oscar Wilde and drape ourselves over divans and quote Homer to each other. And oh, okay. Kind of like, yeah. Right. Um, but I guess we'd also be working. We'd also be productive in the way we'd be freed up to create the way we want to. It's very interesting that he thinks those are compatible, whereas Plato says n no, right? And uh, it's of the two of those, you look at something like medieval society. Yes. Right? Yeah. And there you have a very clear distinction kind of between the laity. Uh, yeah. who are marrying and giving in marriage and, right, uh, right. and yeah, working yeah. at their vocations, as, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah. And then you do have people who are sort of seen as being called to a higher vocation. And again, that is, that is asceticism. There is a kind of communism to this lifestyle of the, of the, of the monk, of the monastery. Yes. Um, and there's a renunciation of marriage. And with that comes the renunciation of sexual intercourse, which is not the case with Marx and Engels at all, right? right. And they're, they're, they get rid of the family unit because that's tied to property and inheritance and yeah. capitalism and everything. Uh, but there's, of course, there's, now, there, now there's sexual freedom and liberation right. in, in their ideal society. Yeah. Uh, whereas, which, I, you know, and perhaps that's true of Plato too. I don't think, yeah. were his guardians meant to be celibate? I don't recall him saying yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but uh, Christianity does also see this role for communism that's closer probably to Plato in some way. I would say, right? In that, in that sense of understanding it as, no, this is a renunciation for a greater good. Right. Uh, Marx, Marx hangs on to communism, right? Uh, in the sense of... So what do you mean by communism there? Well, what I mean is something like what acts... Well, okay, let's talk more broadly about communism. Lower C communism, right? Yeah, okay. There's a communism in the Book of Acts, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's what's quoted at the beginning of the, the Soviet Constitution, Right. Uh, the idea that everyone came forth and brought from, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to his need, right? And they had all things common. Did they quote that in the Communist Soviet? Yeah, I believe it's like one of the first things that's mentioned so, in the Soviet. Oh, I, th I thought they only quoted from uh, Thessalonians. Which is, uh, the uh, no, oh, he, he, he does not eat, oh uh, I guess that's uh, true. Yeah, I think that's the direct, the yeah, sorry, they directly quote that, yeah, Thessalonians. Yeah. Okay, but, but, this is but the sentiment, okay. though, is from Acts, okay. right? Like right, the, right. The, the, oh. the maxim is... Um, that from each according to his ability to each according to his need, right? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so there's that Christian communism that goes on there in the broad yeah, sense, right? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I would agree necessarily. Yeah, well, I wouldn't call it that. Okay. Yeah, because you have to back up a chapter uh, before they're sharing things in common. Because uh, what's happening... Uh, or is it, that's at the end of chapter two, is it not? Yeah. Uh, yeah right. Sorry, you just back up to the beginning of chapter two. But... That's 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 a function of Pentecost. Yes. What they're doing. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So so I think you, well, you have to root it in the uh, Paschal mystery, what their their behavior, right? What yes. they're doing in terms mm -hmm. of sharing things in common and so on. So, um, but so I might well, resist calling it lowercase communism, but 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 it depends what you mean by communism, I suppose. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Barnabas, who's uh, Joseph from um, Cyprus. Is he? Mm -hmm. um, who who uh, sells his field, right? Yes. So he sells his field, and then he becomes the son of encouragement, right? He becomes Barnabas. It's like, well, like a religious uh, or someone who's being confirmed, right? You can mm -hmm. you know change your name. You yes. take, take yes. this new orientation in life towards this mission of the spirit that is given to you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so um, in that sense, yes, things can be shared in common. 
Yes. But uh, okay. anyhow, it's just, just a caveat there. I, I but okay. So well, that's uh, that's exactly it. I, the the com- the communism, the communality, the communality, let's sure, say, sure. of the Book of Acts is inseparable from the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Right. And you can even see this in some uh, theologians of the 20th century, like Balthazar in his doctoral thesis talks about. He advocates for what he calls Christian socialism, but he yeah. calls it. Um, Oh gosh, what is this term for it? It's a kairos, right? Oh, it's kairos. a, it's okay. a, it's a, mo- it's a, an, a, a time. It it's a moment. Oh, oh, kairos is in time. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, not uh, kairos. Yeah, 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 sorry, okay, yeah. Okay. As opposed to chronos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just chronological time. Yeah. So it's like a moment. It, you know, it's a time in yeah, which yeah. God acts, yeah. right? A season. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um, and so the socialism that would occur there is it's not something you can implement through any kind of economic arrangement or political arrangement, right? It's right. it's a movement of the spirit that right. results in this, you know, something like what Dorothy Day does, right? With the yeah, Catholic worker, right? right? Okay. Uh, uh, Marx hangs on to this, um, but it divorces it from virtue in that sense, right? Like there, there has to be a renunciation, there has to be a kenosis to that kind of communism, like a yes. self-emptying. What does kenosis mean again? A self, you know, emptying of, well, emptying, I think it's just what it means in Greek, but like yeah. there's a self-emptying, yes. right? Yeah. It comes in Philippians too, right? Christ emptied himself uh, and yes. in the incarnation. Yeah. Right. Uh, Balthazar, who I've also just <laughs> referred to, says that the Trinity consists of kenosis. Like the Father empties himself, and that's what the generation of the Son is. And right. the Son and Father yeah. empty themselves towards each other, and that's the yeah. spiration of the Spirit. Yeah. Right. So, and there's a there's a basis for a, a communism there. You know, everything is shared amongst the Trinity. Yes. Right. As as yeah. as the Gospel of John yeah. describes constantly. Yeah. Right. Everything that yeah. I have is the Father's, and so on. Yeah. Um, and and Christian sharing. Um, communion of the saints is an imitation of that. It's a participation in that. Yeah. Now, Marx, and this is why I wanted to start with that excerpt from his commentary in the Gospel of John. I, I really think he must have been inspired by that in some okay. sense because he hangs on to it, but there has to be a death to self for this to happen. Now, this goes back to our Ayn Rand thing, right? Okay. In order to save yourself, right, you actually have to die to yourself. It's oh, a paradox, so and yet it's oh, true. Oh, right? the asceticism here. So, so you're set free yes. uh, mm-hmm. here by giving up your life. So, yes. So, so, yeah. Right. Okay. And I think that's what the the commun the communality comes from, right? You die to yourself, uh, and that gives you a freedom to share your property with others. Oh, I th- I thought it was just others. I just we gave power to the government, and then we died to the government. Well, uh, well, <laughs> Isn't that what plenty, we should do. I mean, plenty of people did die under the communist <laughs> okay. government, so maybe right. that is the principle. You okay. lay down your life for that to happen. But though though it is interesting, Marx does get more skeptical of the government in his later writings. You know, oh, okay. Communist Manifesto is eighteen forty eight. I want to yeah, say forty four. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as he goes on, he talks about, he's very inspired by the Paris Commune, and he has a reflection okay. on that. Yeah. And also his critique of the Gotha program. Like, there was a yeah. proposed uh, socialist program, and yeah. he writes a critique of that, which yeah. is the closest he ever comes to prescribing what? what society would look like. And he's very, like, he thinks it's really dumb for people to still trust the state. He, he gets closer to anarchism okay. as he goes on. Because so. the problem there, then, is he's now undermining his first stage, which is primitive communism. Because under primitive communism, you have this utopian vision of humanity uh, where it's not like we're not even fallen creatures, Mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And and so we all are going to share and there's no uh, surplus value and there's there's no differentiation of labor and so on. Um, And so there's no alienation from our labor and and all all the rest. Mm -hmm. Um, So so if you become skeptical of government then, that means you become skeptical of the human person uh, and what we're actually capable of as opposed to being... Uh, well, to borrow Hobbes, uh, mm-hmm. uh, life is short, uh, solitary, uh, uh, nasty producer in short. But um, mm-hmm. so that's one thing. Um, another thing you mentioned there is that he's divorcing uh, this this communal sharing, or in Marx's terminology, communism, from virtue. And here I might suggest it's more than that. It's divorcing it from the kingdom of God. Yes. So the way I view Marxism is as a heresy, as opposed to what Plato is doing. So this is where I'd see a difference between Plato's dystopianism on, on, you know, give Plato a bad day and what that could, like the dark side of what Plato might look like. It's much mm-hmm. different than the dark side of what Marx looks like. Well, one, Plato is not heretical. He's, he's writing right, before yes, Christ. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas Marx is operating out of this Judeo-Christian framework where you have, we want to think of the cross as an intersection between the vertical and the horizontal, right? Uh, yeah. And so this is our, our sharing loving each other, you know, wanting the best for one's neighbor and so on, which he has that impulse within communism, which the logical extrapolation of that is 
yeah, we don't have any wars anymore. We don't even need uh, the Leviathan to keep us in order and all the rest. Mm -hmm. We can dispense with all that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we'll have this egalitarian universal society. But he's writing out of that equation the spirit of God, or God himself, yeah. right? So there is no Pentecost. Uh, it's the proletariat yeah. uh, that, that's going to usher this in. And this is another major difference I sense with Plato and Marx is the means by which we attain this truth. Mm -hmm. by the means, so again, there's definitely dark sides to Plato, but his impulse is through dialectic. Yeah. Right. So this is the means of which we ascend to the forms, or, or right to uh, yeah. achieve. Mm -hmm. Whereas for Marx, what's the mechanism is violence, mm -hmm. right? So it's this, well, it's this, also dialectic. It's just that it's a well, historical dialectic, material right? dialectic. Yeah. yeah. He's he, now, but when he uses that term, it's a post-Hegelian term. Sure. So yeah. for, for Hegel, just to back up a step, uh, he has his uh, thesis. Mm -hmm antithesis synthesis mm -hmm. uh framework in which he's operating out of uh, and so whereas mm -hmm. hegel has the geist which is being unfurled through history through none other than hegel himself yeah, sure. uh in, in, in the depression state well marx is going to take that impulse of of conflict of the past which is leading to like you had to have conflict between the feudal state and the proletariat who emerges from it, just as you're going to have to have the conflict which is going to lead between the socialists and the capitalists, which is going to lead to something greater, right? Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, yes, there's a dialectic, but he does not mean dialectic as in no, not at uh, all, yeah. exchange of logos, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. This dialogue, yeah. um, which, in fact, when you look at what he's, his plan is uh, in terms of how do you take over parliaments, right? Mm -hmm. Or you, you can make some alliances with some Democrats or whoever's in power, but that's just until you get the control, the means of production uh, and the levers of power. Once you have that, mm -hmm. then you dispense with them and violently if needed. It's, so again, go back to the opening scene of the Republic. Mm -hmm. There's um, Cephalus's, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Polymarchus's slave mm -hmm. who um, runs up to Socrates and says, hold on, Polymarchus wants you to wait. Mm. And Socrates, paraphrasing here a little bit, he's like, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, am I going to, really? It says who? Uh, right, right, and, right. and so he turns out there's a torch racist for the goddess uh, mm -hmm. later that evening. So, oh yeah, we'll stick around, fine. Mm -hmm. um, but the slave is like, don't you see how numerous we are? Yes, uh, yes. You're not going anywhere if, you don't, if we don't want you to go. And Polymarchus is an arms dealer, right? So you can imagine his entourage would be somewhat formidable. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so... Um, that's an interesting, so so. what is going to make you wait, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he says, because Socrates is like, are you going to persuade us? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's dialectic. That's persuasion. Uh, another option is through force. No, and that's Polymarchus' slave's answer. like, can't you see how many of us there are? There's only two of you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, there's no way you're going to add to this. Mm -hmm. So that's another way. We can force you into it. And that's the option that Marx is going to advocate. It's through force. Now there's mm -hmm. a third, uh, and this is kind of what Socrates hints at at the end. Oh, there's a torch racist for the goddess. In other words, there's a higher principle yes. out there that we mm -hmm. keep our eyes fixed on, and that is what will guide how we're going to behave below yes. you, you and I, comrade, mm -hmm. and yes. and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and everyone else. Um, whereas for Marx, there is no higher ultimate mm -hmm. principle. His his, his teolo teolo teological vision is is really doesn't work in an atheistic framework mm -hmm. um but in any case um so it's going to be option two we're going to force you uh right and that's yeah. mm -hmm. that's where we're going we have the vision or, or even in a very benign way history will force you you know even if uh, yes. even if we're not going to take march, up arms to do it yes. right you'll still be compelled by the violence of the historical process right, into right. communism which again that yeah the, the hegelian understanding of this march of reason or this progress of history of, of how things are unfolding so we, um, and that's why he's mythological. He's, he's giving you this narrative by which you can read this march of history. Mm -hmm. It's deterministic, so don't go against it. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? That's futile. Resistance. Yes. <laughs> okay. You're right. Yes, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. You're going to become part of the collective. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, so um, yes, join us. Yes, for sure. Well, uh, keeping in mind that you've told me yes, you've still even three minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess I will conclude with my final thought, which was that I would say that both 
with Marx and with Plato, this is related to what you're saying too. I think, um, you know, they can they construct myths, yeah. and arguably over the course of their life, you can see them becoming uh, demythologizing themselves. I guess you know, in a sense of becoming disillusioned, right? Like oh, Plato I so. has. I think Plato becomes more mythological. Uh, well, well with, with that, in, in yeah. the sense of well, okay, so he tries with uh, Dion, right? Try to make him into a philosopher king. That yeah. does not pan oh, out. Oh, I see what right. you're saying. Oh, yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay, like yeah, so he tries to he tries to implement he tries to make the myth real on Earth. Yeah, yeah, like in Syracuse. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. it does not pan out. I and mean, then yeah. you know, I, I know you can kind of debate this, and this would be a good thing to do in a class. But you know, you could say the laws are you know his his book on the laws is a lot more modest, let's say, than his ideal yeah. of the republic. Right, in terms yeah. of when it comes to actual policy, you know, we yeah. we approximate it as best we can, but it's not the sweeping. Ref- revolution yes. and that that he proposes in the republic and again even marx i would say you, there, there is a progress in his thought you can see as he goes on where he's he would not have written the communist manifesto later in life he seems more skeptical of the state yeah. unfortunately that you know was not adopted by his it, disciples yeah. uh but i would say both marx is right about plato ultimately plato is longing like as you just described he's longing for something transcendent oh, yeah, and yeah. i would say in a sense so is marx whether yeah. Marx admitted that or not. He's trying to fill that void with uh, this historical... He's trying to be a materialist about it. Um, but obviously that, that just leads him into uh, incoherence, right? Yes. Yeah. And ultimately what's interesting is you know, with Plato it's entirely transcendent. Like history is, as George Grant would say, the moving image of an immovable eternity, right? We have to oh. entirely transcend history and become timeless really in our thinking in some sense to a chain... Yeah. In some sense, right? Through dialectic, right? You're climbing up to the ideals, Yes. Right, and then you get to the Phaedo and you die, and fortunately now you're liberated from history, and you can just yeah. contemplate the eternal. For Marx, yes. it's entirely temporal. Right, it's entirely yeah. historical. Yes. Uh, with Christ, what we see is both. It's, like you said, it's the cross. Yes. It's vertical yeah. and horizontal. Yes. It's yeah. timeless. It's just, it's it's eternal. It's God, but He's created this story, the true myth. Right, yes. as Bart and C.S. Lewis would say, yeah. uh, which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the middle is where yes. that intersects, is where the eternal becomes temporal. Yes. Uh, and there is, um, in fact, there is change. There's an Old Testament that comes to an end and a New Testament that begins, and we are aiming at an end to history. Um, yes. And, and this is why, because Marx is a kind of a heretic for misunderstanding that. Um, we don't have time to talk about this, but De Lubach would say he's in a tradition of heresy that goes back to uh, Joachim of Fior, right? right? Yes. Um, but really, we can. It's, uh, it was a very insightful question by our student because I would say both of them are, in a sense, if you combine them both, you get something close to what Christianity says, right? An eternal that we're aspiring towards, and a historical process that leads towards that, uh, but also comes from it—a fall, a redemption, and then a final. Um, culmination of all things at the end of time when everything is when, when the judgment comes and history is set right yes uh, that's that's really what we should be um and, and as marx recognized right, it's an inevitable process that we need to get on board with right, <laughs> right. um yeah, yeah. but for us what that means is working towards the coming of god's kingdom which is what we do every time we pray be our father yes and live it out yeah okay. yeah and then you want to conclude with? Well, yeah, so talking about the creation, fall, redemption, and the difference, though, is also the means by which this comes about. Yeah. So, so it's not by a violent uprising and overthrow of the bourgeoisie mm-hmm. that, that, that this is going to happen. It's, mm-hmm. uh, as St. Augustine says, it's God uh, of creation, it, by his own hand, takes on human life. Mm-hmm. And humans, by their own hand, take God's life, uh, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is the, going back to the term, uh, talking about from Philippians, a kenosis. Mm-hmm. This is God's self-emptying. Mm-hmm. So yes, we all have this impulse, I think, um, you can see it in Plato and Marx and every human, for, for this desire for fulfillment, this desire mm-hmm. to fill it, satisfy our longings, and how, is it, how are we gonna find this, mm-hmm. right? So is it through comp- concupiscence or libido dominati, right? Are we going to mm. step on others or is it through pursuit of desires? Well, yeah, I guess it says we're going to try and find peace that way, but we're not going to find peace in those. Uh, that, that's the wrong-headed uh, way of going about it. Uh, it's only through the love of Christ. Uh, so, so, yes, they have this vision of where they want to go, mm. but, as St. Augustine points out, the Platonists, at least, don't know how to get there, yeah. uh, right? So in yeah. that, 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 I guess, going back to Holy Week and looking forward to the, the Tritium, is this yes. vision of the Paschal mystery mm. and this, this self-emptying of Christ who then gives us the, um, the criteria 
mm-hmm. by which we can love others as love as I have loved you mm-hmm. right so it's not it's not um, in our own image it's in his image yeah. right it's not, it's, not, it's not Peter grabbing a sword right? Right. <laughs> yes. or Judas That's Iscariot it. or yeah. uh, you know the, uh, having his own revolution absolutely yes right? no it's yeah. the way of the cross is yes. what gives birth to the new world yes you know, in, the, yeah, yeah. in the resurrection yes well, uh, in the spirit of that, would you like to close in prayer? Dr. Absolutely. Let us pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent in this world to draw us to new life. As you went up to Jerusalem and so enter into his glory, we pray that by your grace you may purify our hearts, that we too may experience the joy, the beauty, the glory, and the purification of the Paschal Lamb, the Paschal Mystery, of his cross and resurrection. And to this end, we ask for your blessing as we pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Saint Isidore, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.